Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. This is part two of our airway class. So PEEP, um, here's the benefits of PEEP. It increases functional residual capacity. Um, that's kind of a mouthful, but basically functional residual capacity is the remaining volume of gas in your lungs after exhalation. Right? Yeah. This is where we affect all of our pre-oxygenation, right? This is where all the good stuff is when we're washing out the nitrogen and all that stuff. Um, we, it maximizes alveolar recruitment. I think everybody has seen where they, you know, hook it, put an ET tube in a pig trachea connected to lungs yeah. and then you add PEEP to it. I love that video. Turn it down and it de-recruits. Um, it decreases airway resistance, right? By kind of stinting the airways open. Uh, it re reduces ventilation perfusion mismatch. Uh, the things you have to be careful with PEEP is it doesn't inter uh, increase endothoracic pressure, which is why we don't use it in cardiac arrest, right? Um, and with that increase in the thoracic pressure, it decreases preload and cardiac output. So, although it's relatively safe, if you have somebody who's borderline hypotensive or maybe you have a soft blood pressure, I would just be cautious with it. So, but if you need it, you need it. Yeah. And then, having an oxygenation, it's kind of like a, another step after pre so or during it. So, you know, we want to leave that nasal cannula on at the flush flow rates, even whenever that paralytic hits. So you're removing the non-rebreather, the BiPAP, or move the BBM out of the way, and you're still letting that oxygen go. So even though they're not spontaneously breathing, you're increasing such a high concentration of oxygen all the way down to the alveoli, and it's diffusing, you know, into a lower concentration into yeah, the blood. Yeah, into the blood. Yeah. So. so leave the nasal cannula on. So oxygen reserves, so adequate reserves, right? If you have a patient who's near 100%, right? Obviously you don't want to do uh, ventilations via BVM. Um, but also just because they're at 100% doesn't mean you won't have to provide ventilations. Um, just be cautious. So if a patient has limited reserves, which is way, the way we describe it as 94 to 97%, you might need to add some non-invasive positive pressure to that patient. Um, and if they have no reserves less than 94%, you are going to have to provide BVM or positive pressure ventilations, whether that's by BVM, CPAP, um, in addition to a high flow nasal cannula. And remember that SPO2 is a delayed vital sign, like we were saying earlier. Um, we've got ear probes on our uh, life packs now, so I think they said that it can read like 10 to 15 seconds, you can get a reading. Um, never fails that if you use the finger probe one that if you, you know, blood pressure cycles and you see a drop, yeah. it takes a few seconds for someone to realize going on? that. So use that ear probe, works faster and kind of misses that issue. But if they're hypotensive, hypothermic, that can cause problems. Um, yeah. Carbon monoxide, if they're like in a house fire or something like that. Um, we got the uh, rainbow sensor. 520% higher odds of perinnovation cardiac arrest if you innovate a hypotensive patient defined as a systolic blood pressure of 100 or lower. Right? That's pretty scary. So um, you have to resuscitate your hemodynamics or a patient's hemodynamics before you push induction agents. Right. So hemodynamics, uh, your normal map is you know 70 to 100, and if you feel you know you want to calculate that, the formula's right there on the screen. Um, hypotension is often preventable and very predictable. You know, you can oftentimes walk into a room if somebody's pale, diaphoretic, maybe they're having a stimuli, like that patient's got a good chance of going into cardiogenic shock. Or you walk into a nursing home and the patient is GCS of three, tachypnic, right? Uh, warm to the touch, you're like, oh, I better check her blood pressure real quick. Um, so when you're resuscitating patients, and uh, I can't remember where who helped us get this information? It might have been, um, I think it was Scott Weingart on his smack uh, airway that he did on YouTube, or the class he uploaded to YouTube. Um, he does a great or a great lecture on it. He says, um, not only do you need to fix the blood pressure, but aim for a higher map. So when you do push your induction agent, it drops it down to a more normal level, if that you makes room, sense. you room to play with. Right. Yeah. So we like to tell our guys, like let's say if you had a septic patient who's 70 over 40 and you've given two liters in addition to norepi, like I wouldn't aim for 90 or 100. I would aim for 140, 130. So if they do drop, mm -hmm. they drop to a more normal level, not to, you know, 50. So, so always aim higher for your blood pressures. Um, and then also what we'll 
change your hemodynamics is switching from a negative pressure to a positive pressure, i.e. like you switch them, you innovate them and then switch them over to the ventilator, you're providing bag mass, bag valve mass ventilations. So it just increases, increases in the thoracic pressure, which pushes down the heart, decreases cardiac output. Yeah. And for most patients, that's not going to be even noticeable, but no. the people that are, that sick, we're talking sick, about. Sick, yeah, patients, yes. Yeah, that are already kind of on the, on the edge. Yeah. Yeah. So try to get two IVs on, you know, our patients, especially if they're critical. And we tell our guys, like, if you miss one IV and they're that critical, jump to an IO. Mm -hmm. um, we go humoral head or proximal humoral. Yeah, humerus and femoral. Yeah. There you go. Distal femur and proximal femurs. <laughs> I think, I think Wheeler started more IOs this year than I filled up my car. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. We do IOs a lot. Well, one, you know, and, and we learned this over the last year being under best. Um, is that you can get five liters a minute out of your humoral head and your distal femur. So if you have a sick patient you can't get an IV on, um, who cares about starting an IO? You know, we need to get out of the mindset of it being an invasive procedure. Like, who cares at that point? Um, you know, your overall um, goal is to not kill your patient. Right? If they need to be resuscitated, they need to be resuscitated. And you can do that with an IO, I promise you. Yeah. Um, so start fluids. Um, as far as blood products are concerned, I'm pretty happy that now we're carrying PRBCs. So if yeah. you have somebody in hemorrhagic shock or, uh, you know, maybe a GI bleed, you know, we can start giving uh, blood products. Um, uh, push dose pressors as well for a treatment option to get uh, somebody's hemodynamics up. I've noticed here lately now that we got push dose pressors that people are drawing them up prophylactically just in case shit goes down. Yeah. You know? Yeah, having that syringe um, on the on the actuator oh, yeah. that is well labeled, well labeled, well labeled, uh, is, right. is very is very handy. Yes, um, and maybe being a good team player. I mean, knowing how to mix that together. Yeah, you know, anybody in the truck doing that, yeah. just having it available, yeah. and then our feel, infusions. I feel like the labeling thing is really oh, really no, worth huge. mentioning because it's huge. man, hey, I, I've been on calls. You put two syringes. Down, oh, and yeah. you're like, yeah. Do we need to just push them at the same time now? Yeah, 50, 50 shots. <laughs> well, and, you know, and Northtown's probably going to kill me, but yeah, you need to label your atomic in rock, you know, or maybe your ketamine in rock, but you really got to change. You really got to label that epi. The atomic in rock, yeah. or you jack those up like yeah. 60 yeah. seconds to 60 yeah. seconds, you know what I mean? Exactly. So, um, yeah, pushing the whole syringe of epi might be a little awkward. Yeah. So, so here's where we kind of get into the seven Ps, and uh, I know, I feel like it could be... I think we could have gone over a little bit more on the seven Ps, but like I think we just kind of advance in our airway management yeah. um, to where we don't really hit it too much, but we go over the process nonetheless. Um, so as far as pre preparation goes, right, address reversible causes. Um, the first thing that should hit your mind when you're about to take somebody's airway is, right, are they hypoglycemic or they have a narcotic overdose? Yep. Those are going to be the two main causes that you can reverse on scene. Yep. Um, y'all correct me if I'm wrong if y'all can think of anything just, else. Just had one like yesterday, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, last thing you want to do is innovate somebody with a blood sugar of 30, you know, yeah. or not saying that they don't need it if they aspirated or something like that, but, or you know, one roll let's try to fix theirs. Let's try to fix theirs. Or that uh, one milligram of Narcan would have woken up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then construct a plan, you know, like you were saying, like, man, it really takes the weight off your shoulders. Um, it kind of gets everybody in the mindset of like, Hey, this, we're about to RS have this patient. You know, you can look at somebody like, okay, they got airway. I'm going to do the monitor and vital signs. You know, like, okay, they got that. I'm going to do, you know, IV and do fluid resuscitation, right? So it's more of a team approach. Um, and so really, if you're in that mindset, like it kind of rolls kind of aside themselves, you know, um, and then have backup airways, you know, have backup plans, prepare equipment. And then obviously the most important part is have you address their oxygenation and hemodynamic status. Now getting into our medications, paralysis with induction. Um, so our two induction medications are ketamine and atomidate, right? And then we have our paralytic, which is rock uh, Not going to get into the whole sucks versus rock argument right now, yeah. but rock is uh, we are very pro-rock. Rock is um, better, yeah. So our dosages for ketamine is one mg per kg of ideal body weight, um, and atomidate is 0.3 mg per kg. And best EMS really made it easy on us with uh, not having to really calculate atomidate, right? Decimals. Um, yeah, that's yeah. dang it. Um, but basically what we like to say is, you know, I'm a pretty small guy, so I would get 10 milligrams, sure. Lane would get 20, yeah. and then, you know, your larger patients out there, probably 6'4", six, 6'2", six, would get 30 milligrams of Atomidate. Yeah. Um, so it kind of makes it easy on you. Um, what? I 
am 6'2". So. Yeah. Oh, you are 6'2"? Yeah. Oh, okay. Kind of, kind of a smaller guy. Yeah, like, yeah but you're, yeah. Dude, you're a smaller guy. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously, you want to give your induction agent first and then follow it by your paralytic, and then we're going to get into that here in a second. Um, people often ask, like, okay, well, do you want to go, like, what's your justification on going to ketamine versus automatic? Well, I like to make this process as easy as I can on myself and for others. So what I say is if they have like a normalish blood pressure, I usually go ketamine, right? And if they're hypertensive, I'll go automatic. Now I'm not getting into the whole argument about does ketamine increase ICP? We know it hasn't been proven or anything yeah. like that. Just I think using a lot of my the things with ketamine have been debunked about. Yeah, no, no, no. Ketamine is very, very, very. It's safe. a, uh, it's a horse tranquilizer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but automatic is also a very, very good induction agent. You just have to be very aware that it lasts three to five minutes. Yeah. Okay. I think with some of that data, the new data coming out, like automatic, you know, is as safe, if not maybe even safer than ketamine. But we'll kind of yeah. see how that yeah. plays out. Yeah. Um, and the rocaronium, obviously, it's one mg per keg uh, for now. Um, so. I think one important thing is all of these are weight-based and they're all ideal body weight. So I don't know if we're going to figure that out. So if I, yeah. if I have a 500-pound patient, I'm not supposed to give, you know, whatever, yeah, 200, 250, of 250 milligrams of ketamine. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, no, so obviously there's a lot of ideal body weight or ideal body weight charts out there. Um, I got this from uh, the Flight Bridge vent book, and it makes it super easy because it's all an estimate, anyways, unless you have a tape measure on hand and you're measuring exactly how tall the patient is, yeah. right? So that whole 2.2 or 2.3 per kilo. Again, all, decimals. Yeah, what we do is if you are five foot, you should weigh 50 kilos. Mm -hmm. Every inch over that, you just times it by two. So yeah. if you're 5'10, 10, 10 times two would be 20. Yeah. 20 plus 50 would be 70. Their ideal body weight should be 70. I mean, that's a lot of right. math, but it's easier than the 2.3. It is, whatever. right, yeah. Or like he was saying, the automate, you know, it lasts three to five minutes. So if you had RSI them, you secured your tube, you need to already be get drawn up your medications for post-sedation. Yeah. So to just, you know, be cognizant of that. Um, when you're I mean, using rocaronium or succinylcholine, right, you need to be managing pain and sedation because they are now paralyzed. Yeah. And they do have; they don't have any pain or sedation on board. Yeah. And if you're, you know, if you're normal patients, if your automatic ketamine is lasting about thirty seconds, or the onset's about thirty seconds, um, there's a thing called sedation lag. So with rock, if it takes fifty to sixty seconds on a normal patient to start working, you're going to have a little buffer in there that they could be somewhat sedated and before they're paralyzed. So they might not be breathing as adequately. And you might not be able to and put a lorinder scope in their mouth. Um, so instead of flushing the line after you give an induction agent, I would be flushing your paralytic with right after your induction agent. Yeah. Um, just so you try to reduce that time as much as possible. Our biggest thing with the equipment just goes back to training. Like if you, I want, well, we require all of our guys to get all of this equipment out when they're practicing to build that muscle memory. Um, before they actually go on these calls because if you know all of this stuff secondhand you can adjust to that trauma patient who has missing you know a missing jaw or maybe it's a pediatric where your um, your heart rate's going to be through the roof right um, but just back on the equipment it's BVM P valve in line you know in title um, and I like to hook all that stuff up and I have a certain place in the truck like me and him set up the exact same way on RSIs like I know that that BVM right there is going to be to the right of me Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to have my video laryngoscope, the screen's going to be sitting on the action wall, the ET tube is going to be under the patient's right shoulder along with suction. We should probably clarify here, we use a, we use a co-pilot video laryngoscope right now, which has a, uh, about a three foot cord mm -hmm. from the laryngoscope to the, to the screen. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's basically a glide scope for the back yeah. of an ambulance. Yeah. So. Um, you know, your ET tube sizes uh, for now, because um, we were hearing a little bit of literature about uh, trauma to the trachea with larger ET tube sizes, but basically men, men get eight, women get 7.5. Um, if you're pediatric, you know, you can always do that, that calculation or get your hand heavy app out or get your bras low tape out, but basically it's age um, plus 16 to about, about four, right? Um, bougie versus rigid stylet, suction is a big one. So when our guys go through credentialing, if you do not have the suction out and you are not suctioning the patient's airway, whenever you drop a laryngoscope, you, you fell. You don't get credentialed, right? It's just one of the big, 
one of the big so you, points. You don't want suction to be like opened out of the package. You want it on, connected, and you want the yes. yonker or the uh, Ducanto yes. on the stretcher, like behind the patient. Yes, yeah. I put it underneath the patient's right shoulder, yeah. along with the ET tube in the package. And when I drop the rundoscope, I'm also suctioning at the same time, right? Because um, I can't tell you how many times where maybe you've got a little sputum built up from bag valve mass ventilations, or maybe they just have a little bit of secretions at the in their airway to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. you just It's better to have it and just suction it out and make it easy on yourself. Um, I think everybody's been in the situation where they didn't have it at least once, yep. and it's like, hey, I'm in here, I need the suction right now, and it takes 15, 20 seconds for you to find the button to turn the vacuum on, and then right. trying to hook it all up and find it, and it's just, it's the difference you between, already needed it. It's yeah. the difference between one attempt and yeah. two attempts most of the time, yeah. if you need it, because yeah. yep. you gotta just, just have it out every single again. time. It's your success in RSI and the details, and that is a very, yeah, very big one. pronounced detail that you have to have out. Um, and obviously your eye gel, you know, have your backups out. Um, if I, the way we teach it, you know, if you have somebody who sat 100%, it wasn't hard to pre-oxygenate them, just have your eye gel out in the package. If you want to unpackage it, that's fine. Yeah. But if I have somebody with limited reserves, I'm going to have it out, gelled up, you know, lubed okay. up and ready to go. Um, and if it's a burn patient or maybe uh, anaphylaxis patient, whether you have active strider, drooling, nonverbal stuff like that, um, have that thing out. Maybe it's a double setup. You've got a scalpel. Multiple, yeah. Right. yeah. Multiple tube sizes. Yeah. Um, there's our co-pilot. Um, here's your yearly reminder on practicing with DL. Any technology can fail. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to realize how much you needed to practice with your DL until yeah. technology fails. Yeah. So. Practice with it. Um, put yourself in those different situations in the training room. Um, I mean, huge. I think we all are huge fans of video laryngoscopes. Yeah. Um, you know, our success rates. You know, five years ago were you know low seventies. Yeah. And uh, not saying that that's contributed to going VL, but it takes a difficulty and innovation. So if mm -hmm. you think about it, and I think we all know this. When you go in with direct laryngoscopy, you're actually manipulating airway. You're pushing anatomy out of the way. Um, with video laryngoscope, you're working around a curve, right? So even obese patients, you're not having to lift up their jaw and you're not struggling and shaking, you yeah. know, trying to visualize the airway and then bougie and all that. Um, but I think what really goes into success is really mastering one technique. And Scott Weingart really gives a really, really good airway lecture on mastering one technique and being proficient at that one technique. Not, not saying you don't need to have your, you know, not practice with your DL, but if you master one technique, your success rates are going to go through the roof. I think one thing with ours, since it is going around a curve and you have the bougie, it's got like a little pre you know, slot in there for it to go around. If it pops off or you have some other blade that doesn't have a track on it, using a bougie, you might be able to get it on the mannequin, maybe some patients, but rigid silet might be the way to go on that because you're around a curve. Yeah. It's difficult. It's not a direct line of sight. You could be messing around way too long for what yeah. you should be. So. Yeah. I love the rigid stylet. I, I always do it. I always do a double setup. I have the bougie ready to go, but I like mean, options. Nine times, oh, yeah. nine times out of ten, the rigid stylet does it just fine. So. Yeah, no, I'm ten out of ten. I don't like the bougie, but you know. yeah. All right, guys, that was part two. Come back for the last one. This has been an episode of the PCHD EMS podcast. Thank you for joining us.